Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses, and in this video we are continuing with The Initiates of the Flame, Chapter 4. The Egyptian Initiate Many ages have elapsed since the Egyptian priest king passed through the pillars of Thebes. Ages before the sinking of Atlantis, thousands of years before the Christian era, Egypt was a land of great truce. The hand of the great white brotherhood was held out to the empire of the Nile, and the ancient pyramid passages resounded with the chants of the initiates. It was then that the pharaoh, now called half-human, half-divine, reigned in ancient Egypt. Pharaoh is the Egyptian word for king. Many of the later pharaohs were degenerate and of little account. It is only the early pharaohs we now list among the priest kings. Try to picture for a moment the great hall of Luxor, its inscriptive columns holding up domes of solid granite, each column carved with the histories of the gods. There at the upper end of the chamber sat the pharaoh of the Nile in his robes of state, around him his counselors, chief among them the priest of the temple. An imposing spectacle it was, the gigantic frame of the later Atlantean robed in gold and priceless jewels on his head in the crown of the north and south, the double empire of the ancient. On his forehead the coiled serpent of the initiate, the serpent which was raised in the wilderness that all looked upon it might live, that sleeping serpent, power in man, which coiled head downward around the tree of life, drove him from the garden of the Lord, but which raised upon the cross became the symbol of Christ. The Pharaoh was an initiate of Scorpio, and the serpent is transmuted Scorpio energy, which working upward in the regenerated individual is called the Kundalini. This serpent was the sign of initiation. It meant that within him the serpent had been raised, for the true Pharaoh was a priest of God, as well as a master of men. There he sat upon the cube altar throne indicating his mastery over the four elements of his physical body, a judge of the living and of the dead, who in spite of all his power and glory, having about him the grandeur of the world's greatest empire, still bowed in humble supplication to the will of the gods. Scepters of Egypt These are the three bodies that are the tools with which we are to build our temple. When they are mastered, they are living proof of our right to kingship. In his hand, he carried the triple scepter of the Nile, the shepherd's crook, the ambubus headed staff, and the flail or the whip, which were the symbols of his work. They represented the powers which he mastered. With the whip, he had subjugated his physical body. With the shepherd's crook, he was the guardian and keeper of his emotional body. With the ambubus headed staff, he was the master of his mind and worthy to wield the powers of government over others. Because first of all, he obeyed the laws himself. The Masonic Apron In the triangle we see spirit descending into the square of matter. Let us so purify matter that spirit may shine through it and make of us lights to guide the footsteps of humanity. The Sacred Scarab in this form, the ancient Egyptians worshipped Kapera, the rising sun, and the sacred scarab was buried with the dead as the symbol of resurrection. For as the sun rises from the darkness of night, so the divine spirit rises from the body that is no more. The life is eternal. With all his robes of state, and with the scarab upon his breast, and with the all-seeing eye above his throne, there was still nothing as precious or as sacred to the ancient Egyptian priest king as the triangular garter or apron, which was the symbol of his initiation. The apron of the ancient Egyptians carried with it the same symbolism as the Masonic apron of today. It symbolized the purification of the bodies. When the seat of the lower emotions, Scorpio, was covered by the white sheepskin of purification. This symbol of purification was the most precious belonging of the ancient pharaoh, and this plain insignia, worn by many others below him in rank and dignity, but equal to him in spiritual purification, was the most precious of all things to the priest king. 
There he sat, writing upon him in the words of the initiate, the symbols of his purification and mastery, a wise king of a wise people. And it was through these priest kings that the divine worked, for they were of the order of Melchizedek. Through them was formed that doctrine which degeneracy has not been able to entirely obliterate, which we know as the divine right of kings. Divine because through spirituality and growth, God was able to manifest through them. They were conscious instruments in the hands of a ready rider, willing and proud to do the work of those with whom, through knowledge and truth, they had attuned themselves. But the time came, as in all nations, when selfishness and egotism entered the heart of the king and people alike. And slowly the hand from the great white brotherhood that fed ancient Egypt was withdrawn, and the powers of darkness transformed the land of glory into one of ruin, and the names of mighty kings were buried beneath the oblivion of degeneracy. Mighty cataclysms shook the world, and out of the land of darkness the great white brotherhood carried the chosen people into the promised land. Egypt, the land of glory, disintegrated into dust. The great temples of the pharaohs are ruins, and the temples of Isis are but broken heaps of sandstone. But what of the priest kings who labored there in the days of its glory? They are still with us, for those who are leaders before are leaders now, if they continue to walk the path. Although his scepter is gone and his priestly vestments are molded away, the priest king still walks the earth with the dignity and the power and the childish simplicity that before made him great. He no longer wears the robes of his order. Although he bears no credentials, he is as much as a priest king now as then, for he still bears the true insignia of his rank. The cold serpent has given place to knowledge and love. The hand that bestowed the riches of the past does the little acts of kindness now. Although he no longer carries the scepters of self-mastery, he still manifests that mastery in his daily life. Although the altar fires within the temple at Karnak have long been dead, the true fire within himself still burns, and before that he still bows as he bowed in the days of Egypt's glory. Although the priest no longer in his counselor, and the wise ones of his country no longer aid him in governmental problems, still he is never alone, for the priest in white and the counselors in blue still march with him and whisper words of strength when he needs them. Have you seen people that somehow you liked regardless of appearances? Have you seen others charming people whom you hated in spite of their charms? Have you seen learned people who were fools or impressed you as such? Or people who knew little and yet you felt were wise? Those are the insignias of rank, which the loss of title or position cannot destroy. Kings with or without crowns they were. Not puppets dressed in tawdry tinsel. And they still are kings and will be to the end of time. And they still manifest their rank, not by their superiority and their high-headedness, but by the soul qualities which they radiate from themselves. The purity of their lives still radiate outward from those who wore the apron of the initiate. For while that triangular apron with its serpent drawn upon it has long since rotted away, still the spiritual counterpart of that symbol radiates in their daily lives, proving beyond all dispute that they were priest kings and are today. We find them in every walk of life, in high places and down in the mire of life. But wherever we find them, they are still the mouthpieces of God, and through them comes the promise to all who strive. They are kings, not of the earth, but of heaven. And in the life of our own master, we find one who joined himself to those who served, and was a true king even when his only crown was a wreath of thorns. Still in the pyramids of Giza, the initiations continue. Still the initiate receives the insignia of his rank. Before that fire within himself, he makes his vows. And upon the burning altar of his higher being, he lays his crown and his scepter, his robes and his diamonds, his hates and his fears, and sacrifices his life as a priest king, and swears to serve none but his own higher self, the God within. His robes are his soul body, 
and his crown is his life, and in the streets of life he is enthroned. The dusky towers and factory chimneys around him faded into the templed pillars of Luxor, and with a lunch pail on his arms, his face brown with honest dirt, he is as much a king as when the crown of the double Nile rested upon his brow, and the priest of the temple made him one with his God and his fellow man. The priest before the Ark of the Covenant, and the spirit over the mercy seat. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And please consider donating a little to Wars of the Roses. Links are in the description. Thank you very much. Mighty, mighty, mighty cataclysms. Mighty, cata, mighty cataclysms. Mighty cataclysms shook the world. Mighty cataclysms shook the world.